Okay, this is session one of World of Dungeons Ravenloft. Uh, we are playing uh, five sessions of World of Dungeons using I6, the original Ravenloft module from first edition AD&D. Uh, I have a procedure that I do at the beginning called CATS, um, that's C-A-T-S, concept, aim, tone, and subject matter. Um, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Concept, uh, World of Dungeons is a very stripped down, a little more abstracted version of Dungeon World. Uh, it plays a lot like Dungeon World, it feels a lot like Dungeon World, but it's a little bit more uh, freeform because it doesn't have a bunch of moves that kind of, that you are kind of focusing on triggering. Um, Ravenloft, <laughs> uh, the Ravenloft module, what we're gonna do for this five session series is we're gonna get through the whole module and um, it will be, it, at times it will feel a lot like a dungeon crawl because that's really all the module is, is a dungeon crawl. Um, but one of the nice things about World of Dungeons is there is a mechanic, a beautiful mechanic called the Die of Fate. And basically the GM rolls the Die of Fate, it's a D6, at, in every new location, encounter, room. And depending what that die is, kind of depend, like kind of dictates the relative easiness or dangerousness of that location or encounter. And it's nice because what it does, is it lets you kind of, I, I use the die of fate to kind of like pull forward the more interesting stuff and push aside the less interesting stuff. So even though it's a dungeon crawl, it shouldn't feel like a slog. That's my goal. Um, the aim uh, for this session is to, after I'm done with this bit, we're going to introduce characters. Then we are going to have a little opening scene, a little opening encounter. Um, at that point, I'll kind of give you guys the the basic, loose, uh, sketchy mission that, that you're all finding yourselves on. Um, I will then ask you guys a series of what I call establishing questions. There'll be one for each of you. Uh, these establishing questions are your chance to kind of put your spin on Ravenloft, to put your structure. And I take the information from the establishing questions, the answers you give me, and I um, I incorporate that stuff into the adventure for next session or, or even in the session if I'm really Johnny on it. So, um, but definitely by next session, <laughs> I'll have incorporated some of that stuff. Uh, we'll take that break after I ask those questions. We'll take a good long break so you guys can think about it because it's important and we'll come back, answer them and then uh, continue the adventure. So, and play until we uh, are near the time. So tone, I'm, I'm imagining this is going to be, you know, Ravenloft, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I, I'm assuming you're all familiar with Ravenloft. It's not, if not, it's cool. But basically, Ravenloft is a, uh, a gothic horror D&D setting, and it really leans into, like, classic vampire tropes. And so, um, you know, the the lonely elder vampire who pines for his long lost love, right? Like, it's that kind of, like, thing, right? Um the tone I'd like to maintain is uh, dark, uh, creepy, but melodramatic is okay too. I think there's like a lot of space for melodrama and um, gallows humor too, if the opportunity presents itself. Uh, no gonzoness, I think that's we should avoid. Uh, subject matter wise, you know, if I'm playing the module straight, um, it is not. Uh, extremely kind to women uh, because of its time period that it was made in. Um, it has a lot of like very like tropey ways it deals with 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 characters. Um, but having said that, the, the principal like um, woman woman protagonist slash I don't know, like victim person, uh, she is a little bit more like uh, actively involved in things. She's not just a damsel in distress. Um, but the, the module otherwise doesn't have any kind of like there's nothing like sexual assault or rape or anything like that uh, in this. And I don't want our story to go there either. And so the only thing I really put a hard line on is uh, sexual assault. I'm not super into cruelty to children either. Um, if you guys have any other like things you want to put behind a line, uh, go ahead and say so now. Um, I'll give you guys a minute if you need it. Otherwise, uh, we'll have the X card in play. So uh, like in all Gauntlet Hangouts games, um, if you if something happens that you are uncomfortable with in an unfun way, because sometimes discomfort can be fun, um, just say X or X card and we'll stop and we will um, we'll change whatever just happened. 
Do you guys have any questions about that? All right, cool. In that just case, for the record, I'm I'm not particularly familiar with Ravenloft, but it seems oh, okay. Oh, no, fair. Okay, no, that's good. Um, I, it's uh, well, nor am I. That's great. Awesome. Uh, so I, I'm super familiar with it because I'm an old two E kid. Um, it is a gothic horror D and D setting. Uh, wolves, vampires, uh, ghosts, that kind of thing. Right. Um, that's it. <laughs> it's it's Dracula, yeah. Dracula, Dracula D and D. Okay, so let's introduce characters. Uh, I'm going to go in the order of the sheet. So, uh, Harry, please tell us about uh, Polly, I guess. Polly is, um, at first you might think he's a girl. Uh, long, dark hair, small, um, slender. Age is kind of hard to tell, but could be somewhere between 16 and 20, so young. A uh, little guy, um, he's he's pretty running things uh, close to the edge. He's on the run, you'd know that. Um, he All his belongings pretty much are things that he's picked up along the way. Um, there's a few little things that he stole from the person he's running from. Um, he's got... Uh, dark eyes and dark eyebrows and, and long black hair. Um, no armor. Two knives as weapons. He sneaks around and he's very quick. And he, he often speaks in a strange manner. I'm not going to be able to uh, actually do it because I'd totally wreck it. But uh, you know, I, I was raised by someone who is um, uh, an old witch, essentially. Um, so I say things that I learned from her. Um, like speaking often in they are. or cryptically? Or... Yeah, something, sometimes like that, or sometimes just the vocabulary. Like in, instead of, uh, you know, stew, I might say chiza, because that's what she always said when she was making the stew. Um, so some foreign words and that sort of thing. Got it. Okay, I like that. Yeah, you've like picked up things and maybe even like miss... Uh, place them in, in in terms of what they mean I like that. Sure. Um, I noticed you have a I noticed you have a skill that says which things. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm into that. Uh, your class is a thief. Uh, what are your flags? Oh, uh, I uh, ask you to uh, ask me to do something daring or acrobatic. So I'm a daredevil, um, and I'm also fairly gullible. I you know was raised by a a a witch. Um, so I, I know very little about the world outside. So you can tell me anything and I'll probably believe it to the extent that I believe you. Awesome. I love it. Uh, I will probably um, interrogate this idea of you being raised by a witch as we go. I think it's super interesting. Um, for, at the outset, though, that's great. Um, it's like just enough to kind of hang everything on. Um, does anybody have any questions for Harry about Polly? Okay, in that case, continuing right along. Uh, Matt, please tell us about Stosh. And you're muted if you're talking. Sorry about that. Um, Stosh is in his late 20s, um, pretty average looking, um, you know, Brown hair, brown eyes, tan skin. Uh, he's got a most noticeable physical feature is a, a scar across his uh, face um, long ago, something that's since healed and it didn't cause any impairment as far as his eyes or anything, but it's, it's very, very noticeable. Um, he wears some battered, battered leather armor, uh, carries a, uh, you know, serviceable uh, sword that he is... Uh, almost uh, obsessively cares for as far as like oiling and sharpening stuff like that. Um, you know, for the last like decade or so, he's been a bit of a wanderer, um, just kind of a sellsword. Um, let's see. Uh, he's got a bit of a gambling problem. The problem is that he's, he's just not good at it, um, but he's not a frequent gambler, but it kind of explains his lack of lack of funds at the moment. Um, but for the most part, he, he's friendly. He just hasn't had had a lot of good luck in, luck in life. Um, 
as far as his background, uh, you know, he's a full family, couple siblings, parents, uh, but his whole family is involved in this this cult that that worships worships the sun. I like it. Why do you suppose that's a cult? It doesn't seem like cult like activity. Is there something about these lands or about where they come from? Um, it's just, uh, I'd say it's just, it's, it's more looked on. It, it's not recognized by, you know, like the religious authorities. Uh, it's kind of like an old, old, uh, it's like pagan or something. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it, okay. it kind of, people view it as, uh, like ignorant. Um, but it, you know, it's just been a family tradition for a long time. Um, let's see. Awesome. Uh, and what are your flags? Uh, tell me a lie, I believe, and then ask me to give you a weapon at a time of need or desperation. Mm, I like uh, that. Might be interesting, being that I only have one weapon. So. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> a couple of tell me a lie, I believe, I like uh, in, the t in the party. I think that's super interesting that, um, uh, <laughs> you guys just want your characters to be deceived, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently, by by Anaket's character. <laughs> Either that, or you guys are just lying to each other. Or not each other, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, awesome. Uh, I don't think I have any other questions about Stash at this moment. Uh, you you have short sword, awesome. Um, late twenties, so for her. Okay, good. Let's see here then. In that case, let's move on to Anakat. Tell us about Goro, please. Is he a four-armed dragon person by chance? He is not a four-armed dragon person, unfortunately. Um, no, he's a, a shortish, stout, tubby, red-faced white guy with a big beard. Um, he is very cheerful. He likes to drink. He sort of projects optimism, um, but if you're if you're paying attention or you know him well, you can tell it seems a little bit forced. Um, he took to adventuring after he basically slept with a bishop's wife, and that made it a little bit hard to find work as a preacher or a deacon in any sort of civilized area. Um, let's see. He is decent at curing people, can turn undead when necessary. Um, and yeah. Turning it seems like a really, really great thing for this setting. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad I picked that. It should be very <laughs> I mean, helpful. <laughs> having not known in advance what Ravenloft was about. <laughs> awesome. Um, tell me a little bit about your religion. Like what are the basic tenets? Any thoughts? So <laughs> I, I pushed some buttons on a random religion generator and I got Atar, the god of penance, which seemed extremely appropriate for this guy. Um, I think perhaps he started worshiping Atar after this all happened. Um, so he's he sort of regrets what he did or he regrets the way he went about it and is trying to seek some sort of redemption. Wait, so say, say that again. So what, what, what did you do with this guy? Uh, I slept with his wife. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gosh, let me try to miss that bit. Um, <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, awesome. And what are your flags? So I have go incognito so I can mess it up by being easily recognizable. I like this. I so that. You, in you intend to mess things up basically whenever people are like trying to be surreptitious. Is that the idea? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a super subtle guy. Okay. And, I, and apparently I have some reputation. Okay, cool. um, and then get into a dangerous situation that I can protect you from. Because okay. ultimately, I feel he is a good person. Awesome. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to take one quick look at the uh, characters here. Uh, one thing I noticed, um, I just want to explain the, the hit dice and hit points, uh, the way that works, because it's a little weird in World of Dungeons. But basically, you have a certain number of hit dice. It looks like you all have at least two, and Polly has three. Uh, that's awesome. You will always you will roll all, all of them and then keep whatever um, the highest is of uh, equal you, you keep you keep a number equal to your to your level so right now you'll each roll them all and keep one die that will be that is both your max and your current hp so uh polly if you rolled a three your max hp is three presently and you are at three 
Um, every time you rest or if you receive healing of some sort, um, you get to roll them again to try to get a new thing, which, by the way, can make you lower <laughs> than what you had. So <laughs> um, we don't do automatic death on zero hit points the way I play it. Um, I do a black hack style uh, little, yeah, it's, all, it's kind of like a last breath thing if you're familiar with Dungeon World. Basically, if you go to zero hit points, as long as someone in the party remains alive at the end, um, you get to roll a d6, and you only actually die on on a one on that roll. Okay, uh, and then two through six is like degrees of living, but with some kind of penalty, right? So. Um, so that's that, and then uh, cool. All right. I don't think I have anything else I need to go over before we begin, so let's just begin. Get our little opening scene out of the way. Out of the way, should be fun. I'm gonna be reading a lot from the module. Uh, that's part of what I'm doing with this Wednesday Time Machine thing, is I am I am trying to use the modules um, as much as possible, so just know that. I'm gonna frame this up pretty hard um, and say that presently, Stosh and Goro, our fighter and our cleric, are on the old Svalich road. I'll type that in for you. The old Svalich road. This is a few hours away. You're roughly five or six hours away from the gate to the lands of Barovia. Uh, Barovia is, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a country, it's a region, okay? It's a small little region. And you're, you're both are going there for a reason we're gonna talk about later. But for now, just know that's what's happening. Polly, you are also near this road, but maybe not on it. I think, well, let me just, let me read the module. A little bit about the old Svalich road. Black pools of water stand like dark mirrors about the muddy roadway. Thick, cold mists spread a pallor over the road. Giant tree trunks stand on both sides of the road, their branches clawing into the mists. In every direction, the mists grow thicker and the forest grows more oppressive. I think it's probably fairly, well, we'll say it's like late in the morning right now, but because of the heavy mists and the overcast, it's very gray, okay? And Stosh and Goro, it always takes me a minute to get names. Stosh and Goro, you, you, you two are on the road, you're traveling together. Polly, you are not traveling with them, you don't even know them. But you are, where are you at? Are you like behind them on the road? Are you in the roughage or in the clearing in the tree tree line or what? Well, it sounds like I might be um, looking for some food or some uh, coin. So I might be kind of lurking by the side of the road for looking to see if there's a weakness in these travelers coming down the road. Maybe I'll maybe. follow them a little bit if they, they look like they're tiring. So let's say maybe you've been following them for a little bit, like kind of uh, incognito, right? Like you're, you're keeping an eye on them, waiting for them to like stop and drop their guard. I like that. It's a great setup. Goro and Stosh, ahead of you, let's say two or 300 paces away up the road. You can't see very far because of the thick fog, but you do begin to see the outline of, um, of a woman. You know it's a woman because uh, her build is slight. And as she gets closer and she's walking in your direction, you see that she is wearing um, kind of like a sort of, it's not traveling clothes at all. It's, 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 it's just like sort of a, a thin white slip of a dress and no shoes as best you can tell. Goro, what do you do? Um, oh, and also, before we... Sorry, Goro. Sorry. I want to direct your attention to the role for your party room that I linked earlier. 
because what we're going to do is I'm going to roll the die of fate. This is the first chance for you guys to see how the die of fate works. So I roll a d6. Um, high numbers, four-ish, four five and six, are great for you guys. It means it's going to be an easier encounter. Uh, one, two, and three, one being the worst, a harder encounter. Okay. So here's that. My die color is, uh, I'm going to roll red, because that's ominous. Five, so it's not looking too bad. So with that in mind, with that out of character knowledge, Goro, what do you do? Well, either way, I would just call out to her in a fairly hearty voice and be like, "Oh my, hold there, my lady, are you are you lost? Can we can we give you an escort to town?" Jason, I think you're muted. She is stepping forward, the mist, the fog, sort of occluding her a little bit, but you still see her pretty well. And she makes no response. She does notice you though. It's like she's looking straight ahead, like staring straight ahead. But as soon as you call out, like her, like she kind of like just gently changes her, the way she's looking as if to like acknowledge that you made a noise, right? but she otherwise continues stepping forward. And as she steps forward, Polly, you notice, but it doesn't seem like the other two notice. You notice that she has at her side an ax, like a hand ax, um, just dropped Ooh. to her side, slightly obscured by the fog, obscured by her wispy gown. Um, but because of your position, you're, you 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 see it. What do you do? Hmm. Well, normally I would say a woman like this might be wealthy and might have some jewelry that that would uh, that would be of interest to me. But but an axe is it doesn't really look right. So so I'm just gonna creep forward and uh, stay in the shadows and and maybe uh, maybe. I get around to the side, the side that doesn't have the axe. You try to get but closer I'm not, to her. Then? I'm not calling it. Yeah, I'm not calling attention to myself or to the uh, the the other two on the road, because um, I'm not sure who my target is at this point. I hope that she was the target because she's she's wealthy, I think. But now this <laughs> axe. Even though she has no shoes and no coin purse, and she's <laughs> she's walking in the middle what? forest. <laughs> Is it my imagination? I'm imagining her with like a white, fine sort of gown on. Like she she might be a rich uh, sure. person who's yeah. lost. Or yeah, sure. yeah, the, yeah, she she looks out of place for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, go ahead. And let's do let's do our, our one move. Uh, you're going to roll plus dexterity for me, please. Uh, stakes here are if it goes poorly for you, she she may she may see you and think you're hostile. Right. Uh, let's see. Real selected. So I just did. Oh, there it is. Uh, nine plus two is eleven. Great. Uh, you you have the advantage here. You can you you have full advantage of 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 being of being stealthy. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, Stosh, out of curiosity, what are you doing when you see the woman approach? Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna step forward. I, I don't think that Stash notices anything amiss. I mean, it certainly seems weird, but he's more curious than wary at this point. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I think I might take a step or two forward and just, just, you know, just say in a, a loud but hopefully gentle voice, "Madam, Madam, are you okay? I noticed you're not wearing shoes. Do you, do you require any sort of aid? Aid, yes. Aid is what I need." That, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly it. And then she kind of like steps forward a little bit more urgently toward you. You notice now she has the ax <laughs> in her hand. Okay. She's probably about 20, 30 paces away. Okay. And she says, um, she says you, you have to help me. You have to help me. You have to free me. You have to free me from this curse. Oh, okay. I, I'm not so sure about curses and I kind of look over towards Goro um, maybe maybe for some direction. Oh, don't be a coward. Of course. 
Of course, we'll help you with your curse, my girl. Tell me more. How can we? How can, what? What is the nature of your curse? Are you cursed to never wear shoes again? By chance, Goro, do you wear a holy symbol? I do wear a holy symbol. As you step forward, Goro, she she seizes back. She's like. <gasps> How do you respond? I look I look confused and I'm trying to figure out if I've done something to frighten her. I might take a step back just to like uh as hold you up step my hands. back, she gets more comfortable. She eases up. Right. Please, sir, to you, Stosh. She says, I I I have been afflicted with something very, very terrible. I have very, a very particular thirst, a particular thirst that seems to never be slaked. And I fear I'm going to hurt someone if I am left to my own devices. And she like raises the ax as if to put it in your hand, Stosh. And she says, please, a quick, hard blow across the neck should do it. What do you do? Um, Stash kind of visibly blanches at this, but he, he does reach out for, for the axe, perhaps thinking that maybe he'll, he'll just take it out of her hands. Um, she falls to her knees after she hands it to you and hands and knees and like puts her head down her black hair sort of like draping over her neck, right? She pulls it over to expose her neck as if you are here, like you are the headman and she's here for you to do your duty. What do you do? Um, <clears throat> let's see, Stash, Stash is gonna reach out. He's gonna put a hand on her shoulder and say, Madam, maybe things aren't so dire. Um, Perhaps we can, maybe you can tell us more about this. Maybe we can help you in a way that's not quite so, so grim. Do me a favor and roll plus charisma. Um, okay. The danger here is I think she might react badly to this or, or maybe she might just be tired of waiting. Who knows? Okay. Uh, I did not catch where we went over dice rolling, and I'm oh, not sure I'll, where to do little, that. Uh, there's a link. I'll just put it. I'll put it in the chat here. You have access to the chat. You just click on that little room. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm. I'm I apologize. I'm at, so I actually switched to my phone. Oh, yo, you can. Oh, you can just roll dice then. It's fine. <laughs> okay. No okay. Right. Um, that is an eleven. Nice. You, she, she looks up at you and she has little, like, little tears, blood red tears streaming down her cheek. And she says, what, what do you mean there might, it, there might be another way? What do you, what do you mean it's not as bad as you think? Well, um, I'm not exactly very knowledgeable about whatever it is you're going through. I, in fact, I, I, I don't even know. You haven't really, really told us. I'm starting to get a picture, but. <laughs> it's starting to come together. <laughs> yeah, slowly. Um, but perhaps you, you, could, you could clarify. Why, why are you so desperate? Why do you think this is your only, your only way out? Polly, you are in a position to see the blood red tears, to see what's going on. And almost certainly the witch has told you of the creatures that live in this area. What do you do? Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you, how much do we know about the world? But it uh, sounds like I know something about it. Oh, yeah. Um, you can know as much as you wish. So. Okay. Hmm. I see that these travelers are kind to her, but I, I don't think that they know the danger that they're in. Um, 
and ha having another person fall to the, the night creatures is, doesn't do anyone any good. So um, I, I step out of the, uh, the mist to your side, Stosh. Uh, I may be, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet away. I don't know what the visual line of sight is, but but not too far away. Um, and as you sort of reach toward her, I, I say, stop, stop. If you value your, your warm blood, don't get any nearer to that creature. I'm going to roll the die of fate upon your mention of the word blood. The result is a four. Goro, upon this person's mention of the word blood, you see the woman who's still kind of hunkered down a little bit, right? But you see her, she's trembling a little bit, right? And she's running her tongue back and forth over her over her teeth. What do you do? I'm starting to get get the picture of what's going on here. So I'll uh I'll say Stash, you want to take a step back and I've got the holy symbol in my hand now and I'm holding it out in front of me and stepping closer to him. Indeed. Um Stash, do you step back? Um, yeah, Stasha is going to take about a half step back, but as he does, he, he's drawing his sword. Okay, good. Uh, are you trying to turn her by chance, Goro? Um, you know, right. So my thinking right now is that she's some she's under some sort of undead curse, but I don't know whether she's fully under it. So I'm I'm just trying to keep Stash safe, like cause her to recoil a little bit, but not actually turning undead. Okay. If that makes sense. Uh, kind of. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's, let's just look at the rules for turning dead. Like, what does it say? It just says I can do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> you can attempt to hold undead at bay with the power of your faith and a holy symbol. I guess that's, uh, that's like, yeah, that's, holding that's what I'm doing. Turning them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what you're doing. So roll plus wisdom, roll plus wisdom for me. Okay. I will be clear. I got a 12. Nice. Um, you have full, full control of the situation. because Well, you have control. You're holding her at bay. And with a 12 plus, you get a bonus, too. You get to, you can, I'll let you name the bonus. Um, I guess, could it be that I get some insight into the degree of her condition? Absolutely. Um, I think as you step forward, you know, she recoils, right? Like at, with your holy symbol, she totally recoils. She backs up. She even like backs up like in a feral manner, like walking back and forth, like walking backwards on all fours, right? Oh, creepy. Hisses, right? Just kind of hissing at you. And you see it. You see like her eyes are now red. Her She has fangs. Like she is, she is suffused with whatever this terrible, terrible condition is. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell Stash and this mysterious thief. I don't, I don't think there's any any coming back for this one. If we don't want to kill her, we best get away quickly. Sounds kill like it's her. You think you can kill her? I mean, she explained to us how. And she's and at this point she's kind of lost herself a little bit, right? Like she's no longer being the pleading, you know, person that she was. She's just like, <sighs> like hissing and like kind of and like she wants to leap, but she can't because she's being held at bay. Stash, what do you do? Yeah, I, I think this is this is all the uh, information that that Stash needed to act. I, I think he's gonna just spring forward. He's gonna go. 
right right for her neck if he can with the short sword. I'll let you roll damage for free because she's being held at bay. Uh, and if you can do enough to kill her, then you'll kill her. Okay. She has, uh, she be... has, she has six HP. So. That's not quite going to do it. So it would be two points of damage. Okay. Um, just describe your attack. What does it look like? Uh, so he already, Stash already has his short sword out. The it's kind of pointed in her direction, and it's just like a quick lunge forward and a slash at at her neck. Nice. Um, she immediately like leaps on your back or on your on your front rather. She like leaps on you, like with her legs wrapped around you. Uh, you know, uses her hand to pull your head back, right? And she's gonna try to go for your go for your neck. Polly, what do you do? She's on his shoulders. Or She's like just like how's... jumped, like jumped in his arms like a baby, <laughs> kind of. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, I am running toward the uh, the the two of them, hmm. and um, I am throwing my body uh, into the air to knock her out of her out of his grip or him out of her grip or however it goes. I'm trying sure. to separate them. Nice. Give me a uh, Whipple's con. Oops. Come on, select you. There we go. Um, uh, nine. Good. Uh, I think you, I'll give you a choice. You can, um, you can knock them both down, and give, and give an opening to Stosh to hit her again, or you can just knock her down and she'll be off Stosh. But otherwise, you guys are facing her as normal. I'll knock them both down. Nice, um, Stosh. Polly comes flying at you, you know, knocks you guys down. You land on top of her, fortunately. What do you do? Um, just uh, I scramble around quickly, and, and my hand closes on the hatchet, and I swing it just directly at her head. If her face is up, it's at her face. Nice. Just roll damage. Roll D6. Okay. So that, that'll be seven, seven points of damage. Nice. Describe killing her, please. Uh, it, it's gruesome. Um, I, it's it's kind of a sloppy hit with this hand axe, and I would say, it, you know, the, the blade catches part of her face, but then mostly it's the side of the axe that that caves in um, her, her skull. Nice, nice. We're gonna wrap that. We'll, we'll finish the scene when we get back, but I want to pause for a moment to talk a little bit about where you guys were headed on the road. Uh, Goro and Stosh. Sometime earlier, maybe a day or two before, you both found yourselves in an inn, like so many adventuring groups do, right? You found yourself in an inn. Uh, you maybe, maybe you didn't even know each other then. And a man came in, um, saw the first person with a good, good sword, uh, and maybe that was you, Stosh. And he came in and he shoved a letter in your hand <laughs> and then he left. Um, it seemed like a desperate action, uh, but the letter read as the following. Hail to thee of might and valor. That's the, that's the dear <laughs> part of the letter. Hail to thee of might and valor. Hail to thee of might and valor. I, a lowly servant of the township of Barovia, send honor to thee. We plead for thy so desperately needed assistance within our community. The love of my life, Irina Koliana, has been afflicted by an evil so deadly that even the good people of our town cannot protect her. She languishes from her wound and I would have her saved from this menace. There's much wealth in this community. I offer all that might be had to thee and thy fellows if thou shalt but answer my desperate plea. Come quickly for her time is at hand. All that I have shall be thine. Kolyan Indrirovich, the Burgomaster. So you got a couple of names there. I'll type them in for you. 
no. <laughs> I don't know if maybe you guys thought this might have been her <laughs> walking down the road. Uh, I will tell you out of character it's not, so don't worry about that. Um, uh, Irina Koliana is this woman mentioned in the letter. It was written by Kolyan Indrirovich. Uh, the Burgomaster of Barovia. Burgomaster being something of like a mayor. And so maybe, you know, maybe you both, for whatever reason, you've answered the call. <laughs> um, you, you're, you're heading there to get to get money, right? To, to help this woman, whatever. Um, but there might be other reasons why you're going to, and we're going to talk about that before we take our break. Questions? Um, yeah. Is is she his wife? The letter says, daughter? the love of my life. Unquote. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering if, if they're the relationship between their names tells us anything about their uh, oh uh, you know I, I will tell you it, it's it's her dad yeah okay it's her dad yeah like like ethnically i guess you guys would probably know that so yeah, it's her father okay um so i have a question yeah it, it, is barovia a country a city a... barovia there's a village of barovia and then the lands surrounding it are also called barovia okay yeah so it's like the lands of barovia the village of barovia um, and you're very close. You're just a few hours away. Uh, the lands of Barovia are ha have a literal wall and gate around them. <laughs> so there's like a gate you go through, and it's like it's like a lord's lands, you know, like so many hectares or whatever. Uh, I do have questions though. Let's see here. A question for Goro. Sure, saving this woman is probably your religious obligation. And sure, the money would be nice, given, given your, your circumstances that you've described to us. But you have a little bit of history in Barovia. I think, in fact, you know someone who came to the Barovia for some reason, and you never heard from them again. I want to know who that is. And importantly, I want to know why have you waited until now to investigate? We'll say it's been, maybe it's been some years, right? So think about that. For Polly, the old witch used to speak of an object in Castle Ravenloft, possibly magical, but definitely very valuable. I want to know what is this object? What is what does she believe it is anyway? And why do you want it? Okay. And for Stosh, a foundational myth of your sun cult has its origin in Castle Ravenloft. Uh, what is this? In what ways does this sort of foundational myth inform why you might be interested in exploring the castle. So basically something really important to the origin of your of your order, to your, your family's cult, is in Castle Ravenloft, okay? Does okay. Yep. Let's take a break. Uh, we'll come back at, uh, we'll just say we'll come back at uh, 10 till the hour, okay? Sounds great.
Right. So let's wrap this scene that we were in. So this woman's body is there with Stosh having just caved in the face, slashed up the face. I don't know. It's 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 a bloody pulp, is what I'm imagining. Just a just a slick of red uh, uh, in the middle of the mists, right, on the ground. Goro, what do you do? What's your first move? Um, I think the first thing I do is is uh, pull Stosh back away from the body and, like, uh, I guess we must have, like, a torch lit or, like, a lantern or something. We'll say a lantern, yeah. Uh, and I like inspect his skin, and I'm asking, "Did did you get bit? Did you get scratched? Did any of the blood uh, get in your eyes or anything?" Um, <laughs> I I think you, you, you're definitely going to see quite a bit of splatter everywhere. I mean, this was just messy and horrific. Um, but Stash right now is just kind of breathing breathing hard, and he, he just. Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think I'm okay. But he's like patting himself down. Good. Good. What about this guy that came out of nowhere and helped you? And, uh, I'm, I'm creeping toward the body uh, quickly um, and, and looking it over for valuables. Good move. Um... I'm assuming that you're going to go for like possible coin purses or, or any kind of like, you know, valuables that might be kept somewhere, uh, you know, like in her, uh, like in her corset or something like that. Right. Um, sure. Give me a wisdom roll. Um, because I think there's something that might be on her person that you may not notice, or there might be something that's, that you're not, you know, that you just, um, uh, that might require a really, a really Seven. close examination. Seven. What are your skills? Oh, it doesn't matter because you get a mess, but um, not having a lot of luck. Um, Damn. No, no coin purse. Um, not even any nice shoes you could, you know, sell. Uh, her beautiful gown mm. is now covered in gore <laughs> and blood. Um, one weird thing, though, is she has. Um, an anklet, a simple thing, a band of hemp uh, woven with some kind of like blue flower woven into the, the weave, like a little, like a little, like a, like a weed like blue flower, you know, like long. Kind of mm, woven more in. symbolic, nothing of value. The blue fat, blue. No gems, no, oh, nothing, no. <laughs> no. Hmm. A little uh, hemp anklet just, with a flower woven into it. I, I, I'm still crouched down. At her feet, having seen that, I, I turned with disgust and uh, and looked to the other two. Got any food? Well, and thanks for your uh, for your timely help. I suppose I can offer you a splash of of wine. I don't sustain myself on mostly wine these days, but <laughs> with a, with a flash, I'm over there by your side. Sort of, I imagine you're a little bit on the large side and I'm a little on the small side. So I'm sort of looking up at you standing next to your wine skin. You look like the number 10. That's great. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pour you a little cup and say, have you found what you were looking for if you were looking for something? I'm afraid we must burn what remains of the body. She ain't got no money on her. Cheers. Um, Splash the wine <laughs> down in one gulp, and I'll—I mean, I'll 
tell Stash what I'm up to as well and like grab some brush and try and light it up and burn her in the road there. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I think um, before Stash moves to, to help you, I'll just kind of reach over and, and gingerly kind of clap uh, Polly on the, on the back and uh, just say thank you. I, not for your, your quick action. I'm not quite sure what, what would have become of me. I, I've never seen a creature move like that. Looking up at you with, with big black eyes and, and a wide grin, I, I smile and just tap you on the shoulder similar to the way you've tapped me. Your, your blood is still warm. Indeed. I'll kind of step back a little bit. Um, I, I should grab some brush. And I'll move to to help Goro. Nice, good. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the answers to your questions while you're watching this <laughs> this woman's this unfortunate creature's body burn. Uh, Goro, tell me about this person who who never came back from Barovia. Yeah, so uh, I think I had a kind of a sad childhood, um, born out of wedlock, consigned to the church because my parents couldn't take care of me. Um, and so uh, my mother was probably around, but the church wouldn't let me see her. Um, and last I heard, she was headed for Barovia. Um, and now that we're both sort of persona non grata in the church. I figure what's the harm in, in seeing what's happened to her. Cool. Like it. How, how old would that make her now? I think I'm probably in my 30s and she probably had me fairly young. So she's probably mid 40s to early 50s. Why haven't you ever tried to find her before? I think because up to this point, I was worried what the church would think of me, right? I didn't, they told me that I should not, like she was, she was a filthy woman and uh, she had sort of soiled herself. And the only way I could sort of maintain my own, the implication was my standing in the church, but they were saying, like, maintain the purity of my soul was to divorce myself of her entirely. Um, yeah. Are you trying to find her, or is this just a, well, since I'm going to Barovia anyway, kind of thing? Um, I think it's I think it's both. When I saw the opportunity to go to Barovia. Uh, I took it and I'm going to intentionally take steps to try and find her as well. Nice, good, thank you. Polly, the old witch used to speak about an object in Castle Ravenloft, possibly magical, but definitely valuable. What is it? Well, she didn't teach me much directly witchcraft. She, she did, sort of did experiments on me, but I had to put two and two together about watching the things that she was doing. Um, she never mentioned it when she was awake, but when she was asleep, sometimes she would talk about something that she said the word sonic, which I don't know exactly what that meant, but I came over time to believe that that was a doll or a, a puppet. Um, but whatever that was, the sonic was was in a gilded cage in Ravenloft. And she's in, in her dreams, she said something about it containing her childhood. Seemed like it was meaningful to her. And if I could get a hold of it, it might give me some power over her. So I'm looking for this, this doll in a cage. Uh, can you spell the word that she? Would yeah, spell? I can type it in. Hmm. 
Awesome. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Uh, very, very gothic horror. I'm here for it. All right. As Stash, Castle Ravenloft is connected to the founding of your church in some way, or at least some myth about your church. Uh, what is it? So, the um, in the the creation story, um, the the earth just emerged from the primordial darkness, you know, at the first light of the sun, and this is how you know existence came into creation. Um, and in the early days, the sun, like the physical manifestation of the sun, the, uh, almost like an avatar, would just kind of like walk, walk the earth, um, clearing out remnants of this primordial darkness, you know, in deep places or, or shadowy places, um, so that, you know, life could emerge and grow and, and prosper. Um, and the main instrument it used, it, it, it would wield this this lance of, of pure light. Um, so, in in time, um, you know, civilizations rose. This this creature, this avatar of the sun, gifted the lance to the most worthy of people. Um, and you know, it was those were the good old days. Like it was, it you know, people ruled in wisdom, and and there was much happiness and prosperity. Uh, in time, it, it was lost, and that led to, you know, centuries and thousands, millennia of suffering. Um, but maybe a few generations back, um, we'll say some some distant cousin, um, yeah, returned. We'll say returned from uh, Barovia, um, saying that he had he had heard he had heard rumors that that the this lance had been recovered, um, and it was held held by a demon um, in in Castle Ravenloft. Great, I love that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, I've got all my notes. I'm right, ready to go. Well, Polly, I guess you're just going to travel with this lot. Is that the idea here? <laughs> I can't Here. steal from them anymore. Now they know that I'm, oh. I'm present. Goro, are you going to adopt Polly? Yeah, I think so. He seems like a maybe a youth that has not had the uh, not had the benefits of of the church's upbringing, and perhaps I imagine it's one of those like sort of like those wolf children, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> a little little uncouth, a little feral, right? Yeah. Pretty much. Um, good. If you've got I, yeah. food scraps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure we can do a little better than scraps in any case. I rub my belly. <laughs> <laughs> Does the burning of the witch's body make you hungry? No, it doesn't. That's, um, you know, I, I have not developed a taste for human flesh. Believe it or not. Surprising. Old witch and all that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's talk about the journey. You're about five hours away from Barovia. Okay. And, you know, maybe like when you hear the conversation, Polly, that they're going to Barovia, maybe that sparks in your mind, you know, the, the stuff about the, about, about the doll and all that stuff, right? We'll kind of fast forward through all that mental process and say, it's about five hours <laughs> to the to the gate uh, of, of the lands of Barovia. I'm going to roll the die of fate to see how that little short-ish journey goes. Clear these dice, two dice out here. And roll one more. A six. It's a good result for you guys. Let me check the notes. As you are walking along this path, the old Svadich Road, the mists, they go in and out, but 
overall thicker. Like every time they come back, they come in just a little bit thicker, right? You, maybe you're talking and sharing stories in the beginning, but after a, certain, after a while of walking, right, you're gonna like eventually just fall into silence, right? Um, you'll have said all the things you need to say. And as you get closer to the gate, you, you don't see it yet, but as you're getting closer and closer and further down the old Svalich road, you each get a sense, a feeling, something you see, something you sense in some other way, could just be an instinct or a feeling, that the land is getting more evil. I'd like to paint the scene here a bit and ask you, how do you know? What do you sense? Even just the subtlest of, of, of indications is, is all right. How do you know that the land is getting more evil? Whoever wants to go first. I think uh, Stash would probably notice um, like an acute lack of direct sunlight and just um, kind of like the resulting blight of, of plants, like everything looks a little sickly, um, you know, still still alive, but just not very well. Excellent. Yeah. Even, even at high noon, like there was no direct sunlight, right? So just a sort of strange gray. What about you, Coral? So up to this point, like there wasn't, there wasn't a ton of wildlife that we saw, but like, you know, every once in a while we would see an owl or like a small rodent run across. And at this point, it somehow seems like there's nothing but crows. Nice. And yet my experience is that at almost every turn, I hear a snap of a branch or a, a rustling. It, and there doesn't seem to be an animal there or anything, but, but there, the wilderness seems to be alive with something. Nice. Polly, at some point in this journey, a couple hours in maybe, your sense of foreboding is temporarily soothed by the sight of a few silver coins, handful, strewn across the path into the brush. What do you do? Hmm. As soon as I see them, I scamper ahead not saying anything to the group, <laughs> running toward the, the, the wealth that's been left here, maybe by that woman. Indeed. I, I pick up the first coin that I reach. I hold it up behind me, and then I reach for the next one. I quickly follow the, the trail. Indeed, indeed. Uh, they go a little ways into the clearing. And a few paces ahead, you see their genesis. There is, uh, well, some of Goro's crows are there, uh, picking away at the last bits of meat from a face down skeleton. Um, and you see what appears to be a sack, a leather sack spilled open onto the ground, just a spray of silver coins on the ground. What do you do? I, I let out a hoop, loud and uh, not, not subtle at all. Uh, friends, we're in <laughs> luck. Our, our, our arrival in uh, Barovia will be a pleasant one. And I dive for the sack of coin. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and you do get some coin. Um, I'm gonna roll a die real quick. A good little amount. 300 silver coin, in fact. Whoa! <laughs> I'm rich! 
<laughs> it's time to retire. <laughs> no, I will share handfuls to my friends. Do you want to split it evenly? Um, or just give them a, a portion, a small portion? Um, you know, yeah, sure. Evenly is fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody can note 100 silver on your, on your sheet, if you wish. Um, and I'll give you guys your first XP award when you get to the gate. Or get past the gate, I should say. Uh, good, good. Um, anything else uh, after you grab the silver? Yeah. Um, well, I want to tell Stosh some lie. Um, Stosh, you, you stick with me and and there'll be more coin, more, more bags of coin just lying on the road. You see? Here, have a handful. Are you a good luck charm? <laughs> That's what you should say. I'm a good luck charm. Can't, can't, you, can't you tell looking at me? <laughs> I mean, this is this is twice in one day that my 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 luck has turned, and and thanks to you, uh, you know, Stosh says that he gratefully reaches out for the coins. True, true. I think you should. De I'd like to suggest that you deepen the lie, Polly, and say that like you have a magical spell on you that makes you a good luck charm, right? Sure. Yes. Like, like really, like make it a real lie, right? Like <laughs> give it some strength. <laughs> Look at me. I I'm. I'm here, and I've escaped the witch. No one else could have ever done that before. I must be lucky. You know, at, at the mention of the word witch, Nastash, his eyes will kind of narrow, and he'll take, not, he won't move backwards, but he'll, his body language is, is less open, and he, he kind of retreats a little bit without moving. Um, a witch. And you so escaped. You do that. Suddenly, I get much more serious. And wait, did you see her? I, <laughs> just furtively, I'll start looking around. I mean, this is this is a little much for for Stash to take after the day he's he's had so far. I, I haven't I haven't seen her. Have you seen her? No. Oh. Oh, no. I I thought maybe. The way we act, you acted, I thought maybe you, you you saw her coming down the road. We're safe. Don't worry. Don't worry about the witch. She only wants me. Okay. Come on. You're not afraid of witches, are you? I'm. Um, as long as they're not about, no, not, not one bit. Um, What about you, God man? Oh, I've witches and their curses and their spells. Foul creatures. To be avoided or, or slain whenever whenever they are found. Oh, I would love to slay this one, but I I don't think it would be easy. I think she's best hidden from. I put my hand on his shoulder, on Polly's shoulder, and I'm like, you can't hide from your problems. You have to face them. Perhaps we can face this witch together someday. Hmm. I just look down at my, my feet. And, and if our cause is just, heart. we will be inevitably victorious. Glance over at the skeleton and then just turn away. Good. You continue on. And now I'm going to do some reading. Jutting from the impenetrable woods on both sides of the road, high stone buttresses loom up gray in the fog. Huge iron gates hang on the stonework. Dew clings with cold tenacity to the rusted bars. Two statues of armed guardians 
silently flank the gate. Their heads, missing from their shoulders, now lie among the weeds at their feet. They greet you only with silence. I'm going to roll the die of fate here. It's a six. <clears throat> Do you approach the gate? Yes. Yeah. As soon as you get within about 50 paces of it, you hear a grinding, a creaking as the gate opens. I can't do a grinding noise, but just imagine it. The gates open up as if to welcome you in to the lands of Barovia. A wave, assuming there is a uh, guard or someone who has opened it for us. You see no one. Enter. Goro, Stosh, do you pass through the gate? Yeah, I mean, I look super disconcerted, but I mean, it seems like a pretty harmless spell, whatever it is. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, Stosh is going to be kind of just panning left and right as he walks forward and, and sword like halfway out of its hilt. Um, but yeah, he will he will cross the gate. Nice. <clears throat> As you pass through the gate, all three of you, you hear that grinding, creaking sound again as the gates close up behind you. And you hear the heavy chunk chunk of whatever lock mechanism keeps them closed snapping back into place. And now you realize as you look behind you that the fog has rolled in very, very thick. You can't see a single thing beyond the gate from the side you came from. Nothing. It's like there's only Barovia. And I'm going to give you guys your first XP uh, reward. You each get 200 XP. Let's go ahead and note that. Uh, Matt, I can note it for you if, if you don't have access to the sheet. I don't know if you do or not. Uh, I do, yeah. Okay. And the coin is worth... Uh, XP as well, right? So we're at 300 total? Yeah, you, you got 100 that that counter with the vampire, and then you split 300. Uh, oh, I uh, see. All right, yeah. so that's our total. Okay. Yeah, so 200 each. <laughs> All right. Uh, and you'll get your um, flag XP at the end of the session. So. All right, I'll run and take a drink of water. The Svalich Woods. If you guys want to take a look at the um, image board, uh, there's an image board in the folder. I don't know if, you, if it's not super important, but it's just you might like to see it just as a reference, I guess. But you guys are, well, the gate is right there at uh, right right there at B, right? Like you guys were on the A road, and now you're on B. You are in the Svalich woods, uh, still on the old Svalich road. And let me just read this to you. Towering trees whose tops are lost in heavy gray mist, even above you, right? The, the fog rolls in and obscures the outside world. Tops are lost in heavy gray mist, 
block out all save a death gray light. The tree trunks almost touch. The thick, damp undergrowth presses in on you, making it impossible even to see one another at all times. The woods have the silence of a forgotten grave, yet exude the feeling of an unsounded scream. <laughs> As you are making your way through the woods, I'd like to just get a read on how you're each feeling right now. Just get your character's mental state. Polly, how are you feeling? I'm terrified. And given that we can't see each other, I think I've grabbed um, Goro, do you have robes or something? What is your vestment? Uh, probably got like a tunic or something with like a trailing Thing below the waist that you could grab onto. All right. Yeah, I've grabbed onto some part of your your robes, and and I'm just holding on to you. I'm scared. And you have the light, I think. <laughs> Someone have light? Yeah, I think we we had a lantern. It just barely pierces the darkness, or barely pierces the fog. It's not even technically nighttime yet. But uh, Goro, how are you feeling? I mean, I think I'm also pretty scared, but I'm sort of reacting to Polly's fear and my own sort of like tendency to force cheer in the face of adversity. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm like talking in a fairly loud voice and uh, telling stories about, uh, you know, adventures that I've had in the fog. Um, I might even tell Polly that uh, you know the po the fog may seem dangerous to us because we can't we can't see what's out in the woods. But don't forget that they can't see us either. The the creatures in the woods they can't find us in fogs like this. So we're actually we're actually safer than we would otherwise. I don't think it's actually true, but I am lying to you anyway. I'm going to roll the die of fate. <laughs> The result is a two. At the precise moment you say that to Polly, Stosh, at the precise moment he says that, you hear a low growling coming from all around. And you get the distinct feeling that there are creatures flanking you, definitely on both sides, possibly front and back, but you hear their low growl and you might even see their black eyes in the mist. How are you feeling? <laughs> um, I mean, even before this, Stash was kind of feeling deeply uneasy, but um, just at that first growl, uh, just, just some, some flop sweat almost and just like, yeah, cold, cold sweat and not feeling very well, <laughs> not feeling very good about what, what about, what's about to happen. The mist clears enough to, for you to see that you are presently surrounded by wolves. Four wolves. Two sort of to the front and side and two sort of to the back and side. A rough circle around you. Their teeth bared. Um, their hackles up. I'll just go around the table. I want to find out, uh, I'll just pull each of you before we do any rolling and find out what you're each doing, how you're, how you're going to get, get ready for this. Uh, Goro, what do you do? Um, I think I was talking in a loud voice. I, I fall, fall silent and then pull, put the lantern on the ground and pull out, pull out my mace. And uh, yeah, sounds good. Polly, what do you do? Mm. The first thing that happens is that from my little teeth, you hear a grrr, I growl, kind of in a wolf-like fashion, and then 
one hand reaches across to the, my right hand reaches across to the left of my body and my left hand reaches across to the right. And from hidden pockets, out come two knives. Um, and I'm low to the ground. I'm stalking forward toward one of the wolves. I'm trying to exhibit fearlessness. Mm, I like that. What about you, Stash? Um, I mean, Stash will just brandish his weapons, kind of crouch down a little bit and just get ready for what, what's about to happen. Um, you know, he's going to try and stay, you know, he's not standing still. He's just kind of moving back and forth, shifting his weight from leg to leg, just, just getting ready to either, to either pounce or to be pounced, pounced upon. I'm going to start with Polly. Polly, I, um, I think there's a chance that you might be able to like, assuming you've made eye contact with the leader of the pack here, mm -hmm. maybe you actually like intimidate the leader of the pack with your, your, your fearlessness, your ferocious, your stance. Uh, if you're into that, I'd say that's a charisma. That's what role. I'm trying to do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Charisma roll. Let's go for it. All right. The the, the risk should be obvious. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, eleven. Nice. Nice. Um, I'm gonna let you back them off. Describe it. All right, I, uh, I I'm crouched down I, and and you know approaching them with the knives out and growling and growling. and the uh, the lead wolf uh, at first he kind of leans into it and and, uh, and and tries to confront me but then then he he realizes that this that there's no turning back from this encounter he may be hungry but he's not as hungry as I am. And he, he turns, and as soon as he gives a little way, the other wolves start backing up, and then he realizes he's he's got to back up as well because his support isn't there. Good, I like it. I would just get a read on how you're feeling, Stosh, because this is a, kind of the third time that Polly has has yeah. demonstrated his. His, his ability, maybe his, you know, his, his good luck. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm totally buying it. Um, yeah. There's, there's it, as weird as this is, there's no, I, I'm Stash is not uncomfortable by the weirdness anymore. I mean, just the massive amount of luck that's been exhibited today. Um, it's kind of overcoming Stash's reticence at, at this odd, odd person and their strange behavior. Um, yeah, that's no, it's great. It's great. You, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Goro, any thoughts before we leave this scene here? I think I'll just, uh, as as the tension releases, I'll I'll mention offhand to Polly. Man, I thought we were offering to escort you to Barovia, but it seems you are the one escorting us. After uh, driving off the. The wolves, I, I turn back to you, and there's almost a wildness in my, my black eyes. Um, it might be a little scary for a second before I straighten up and become more like a late teenager with a little bit of a slouch and put my knives away. I just turn back and head on down the road. Good. Come on, bring up the light. Um, you guys go a little further down the Svalich woods and um, yeah, you, 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 um, you head a little further down the woods and you see an arm sticking out from the underbrush onto the path. You almost trip over it maybe. Goro, what do you do? Just an arm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there might be more, but it's covered by the by the underbrush. I'll I'll sort of like the welcoming place, Barovia, by the way. <laughs> I'll I'll poke it a little bit with with the I mean I'm carrying a mace, so it's not a sharp weapon, but I'll like mm. 
poke it and see if it's still twitching at all, and then I'll try and push back the brush to see if it's attached to anything. Yeah. Um, there's a body. Uh, it's not it's not skeletal like that last body. Um, it's more fresh than that. But um, he has been like just raked with claw marks. Like his it's a, it's a just a peasant of some sort wearing simple you know rough spun clothes face clawed up uh claws torn through his clothing and just you know damaged terrible wounds all over his body whatever it was didn't eat him though interestingly but he was he was mauled dead and you notice now that his arm that was stretched out from the brush, he was clutching, he's clutching a, a piece of paper. I guess I'll see if I can pry it out of his fingers. It's a letter. It says, Hail thee of might and valor. I, the burgomaster of Barovia, send you honor with despair. My adopted daughter, the fair Irina, has been these past nights bitten by a creature calling its race Vampire. For over 400 years, he has drained this land of the lifeblood of its people. Now, my dear Irina languishes and dies from an unholy wound caused by this vile beast. Yet I fear, too, that the creature has some more cunning plan in mind. He has become too powerful to be fought any longer. I think there's more, too. So I say to you, give us up for dead and encircle this land of good. Let holy men call upon their power that the evil that the evil one may be contained within the walls of Weeping Grovia. Leave our sorrows to our graves and save the world from this evil fate of ours. There is much wealth entrapped in this community. Return for your reward after we are all departed for a better life. Signed, Kolyon Idrirovich, Burgomaster. Two distinct messages. Hmm. Your letter is like, come help me. This person's letter is, let us all die. Just cover it with a holy circle. <laughs> and then come get the treasure later. <laughs> I mean, I think I'll, I'll show it to Stosh and be like, what do you, what do you make of this? Um, this is very confusing, but perhaps, perhaps it's time to retrieve the treasure. I, I, we have not encountered one living person here so far. Technically true, <laughs> through the whole adventure. In fact, <laughs> if you don't count Polly, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> well. Judging by those gates back there, it may be a little little late to turn back now. Let's press forward and perhaps find our fortune, perhaps meet our fate. Indeed. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not ready to turn around. Indeed. Uh, let's take our second break. We'll just take like five, okay?
All right. Because uh, we're still waiting on Autocat. Let's come in a minute. Playing this is making me hungry. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> uh, Matt, I assume you're there. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, before you leave this body in the woods, anything else you want to do? Uh, I think Stash is going to look expectantly to um, Polly as, as to and just kind of say, you know, where, where's the silver? <laughs> <laughs> oh, having been given permission, um, Polly jumps down into the ditch with the body and, and starts rifling through it looking for the silver or the, yeah. the, the, uh, the weapons or armor. Wait, no, this, you described this as a, a peasant, right? Uh, it was a peasant, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. All right, not not uh, no weapons or armor, but yes, uh, I'll, I'll look. It's not very hopeful, but I'll look. Die of fate was a six. <laughs> it appears that this person may have been delivering the letter, or was attempting to deliver the letter outside the walls of the of the village, and had a sort of like a taster, an advance payment of, of what one would find after they, after they let Barovia burn. And there's a sack of silver. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find it, I hold it up and look up at uh, Astosh. Here it is. And I just clap my hands and not approvingly. I mean, I, I think Stash is believing this completely, and uh, I think Matt Matt is starting to believe it too. So, <laughs> two hundred silver in total. So, yeah. All right, I just pour it out into into everyone's hands. Yeah. Every, everyone's lucky today. <laughs> I can do a quick calculation on that since I can't do math. Or I'm too lazy to, I should say. <laughs> It's around 66. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we'll just say 66 each. <laughs> give one give one over to the wolves. Oh yeah, I'll put it on the uh, on the body. There you go. On its forehead. Yes. I think there's actually two extra gold, so you could put it one on each eye. Oh, great. <laughs> <Nice>. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> you continue along the Svalich wood. Tall shapes loom out of the dense fog that surrounds everything. The muddy ground underfoot gives way to slick, wet cobblestones. The tall shapes become recognizable as the dwellings of the village of Barovia. The windows of each house stare out from pools of black nothingness. No sound cuts the silence except for a single mournful sobbing that echoes through the streets from a distance. The village of Barovia is not a jumping place. There you hear this, you hear this woman crying in the distance to your left and your right. If we look at the map here, as you're entering, you'll see various um, homes and villages and or homes and businesses rather homes and businesses um the businesses candlestick maker butcher baker blacksmith have been the windows have been smashed the places have been looted mm -hmm. in some cases the doors just freely swing open right like in the in the gentle mist or a gentle you know breeze that occasionally goes through just smashed looted and empty as you make your way down the lane though you'll notice a couple of businesses um as you're kind of like you know working your way through a little bit especially as you get towards this sort of center little town square here area 
to the left and the right, you're going to see what appears to be a shop of some sort that is still functional. Uh, the sign is uh, it has a name. Hold on, um, Bill Drath's Mercantile. And on the other side of the street, there is an inn which has its fire lit, and that is called the Blood of the Vine Tavern. <laughs> and, um, but otherwise, those are the only places you see. You occasionally pass by a house that seems to have people in it. Uh, you can see them walking past, you know, the windows and whatnot. But no one ever comes out. Um, you hear lots of whispering behind doors. Um, a distinct feeling of, of fright, of terror in the air. It's hard to tell what time of day it is because the sun is occluded, but it you would guess it's about... 4 p.m., 5 p.m., and that means it's going to be getting dark fairly soon. I'll just go around the table and find out what you're each doing as you wander around Bar the village of Barovia, Koro. I think I'm likely to walk up and and knock on a random door and and ask after the, the Burgomaster. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Polly? Polly hasn't spent much time in uh, civilization like this. And he, he longs for this kind of life, but seeing the windows smashed and the doors hanging open, he can tell that there's something wrong here. So he's kind of just looking in, especially the empty places and, and running his fingers over the signs and, and trying to um, imagine what it's like to live in a town like this. Uh, he's kind of full of sorrow right now. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Stash? What are you up to? Um, I think Stash, seeing the inn, is probably, almost immediately, is drawn to the inn. Um, He'll go inside with the intent of um, maybe finding a dice game, um, but if not, uh, you know, at least at least a nail, and nice. perhaps from perhaps some conversation. Nice. We'll start with Goro. I want to paint the scene for you here, Goro, a little bit, because uh, I don't know if you've ever played the video game Bloodborne, but in Bloodborne there are like people behind their they have their doors closed to their homes and you can occasionally knock and get them to talk to you, but they, they never open the doors and they just like yell and whisper cryptic things from behind their doors. and They're too scared to open them. It's like that. Okay. All right, <laughs> like, nice. You, you can knock on the door and oftentimes they don't answer, you know, <laughs> it's just like a sort of turn off the lights moment. Right. Um, but occasionally someone, will say something like, go away, go away. It's, it's, too, it's too late to be calling. What, who, what kind of person calls at this ungodly hour? It's like four o'clock. Do you respond to that person? <laughs> yeah. Um... Hi, Harry. Hi. Oh, I think you double muted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll respond and I'll say, we, I'll just, I'll just say we, we received a letter from the Burgomaster. Can you tell us where to find him? Do not speak to me of the Burgomaster. Do not ever, ever speak of, of, of them. Never speak their name. Their, any, their whole cursed family. Leave me be. I see. And, uh, so who, who can we speak to in this town? Oh, I, I've just got I've just got tea on the kettle's just 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 of just whistling now, and then they leave. <laughs> <sighs> well, perhaps we'll have better luck at a business. There seem to be one or two of those still open. Do you head over to Bill Drath's instead? <laughs> sure. Yeah. 
Indeed. Um, Polly, are you keeping your eyes open for anything, or are you just getting a general feel for this? I'm almost expecting that there's ghosts in these homes. I, I, I feel like I look into a house and I expect to see that there's warm food left on the plate and everyone just disappeared. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I'm not looking for anything specific, but I'm looking for the. Uh, I've got. I'm s open to the sense of what happened here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, give me a. Give me a wisdom roll. Seven. I'll let you ask a question, and I'll answer it uh, truthfully, if not completely. Um, if you need a minute, I can go to Stash. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and do that. Okay. Stash, you're heading to the blood of the bl excuse me, the blood of the vine, right? Correct. Awesome. I have some text to read. <laughs> A single shaft of light thrusts into the main square, its brightness like a solid pillar in the heavy fog. Above the gaping doorway, a sign hangs precariously askew, proclaiming this the blood on the vine tavern. You'll notice that the, uh, the sign, uh, the blood of the vine has been, the F has been scratched out in of and replaced with an N. So, so there's blood on the vine. I guess somebody was having a little joke. Um, who knows? Anyway, um, as you step inside, <laughs> the place is very, very... Um, it looks like it used to be a really nice joint, but it's pretty shabby at this point. It doesn't seem like it's been kept up very well. But despite its general shabby appearance, the barman is... is if you take a minute to watch him you'll see that he he has a stack of, 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 of bar glasses, right? He takes each one and he cleans cleans a glass off and puts it over to one side. He takes another glass, sets it down, cleans it with a towel, stacks it up. He goes through that several times until he's done with his stack. And then he moves over to the stack that he just stacked and grabs a bar glass and cleans it off and moves it over to a new stack and does it again. He's just cleaning these same stack of glasses over and over again. And the only other patron in the place, well, there are a few, there are a few Vistani uh, around watching the door. Vistani are our, um, our version of, of, of Roma or gypsies um, in this setting. You see them, you recognize them, you know their type. Um, but you, you definitely recognize them by the, the sort of gold bangles they wear uh, and, their, and their sort of the things they have woven in their hair, right? Mm -hmm. They seem to be watching the door. And then there is um, another individual as well. Um, a man, a uh, nicely dressed younger man sipping wine in the corner. What do you do? Uh, well... I think I, I would approach um, the barman to maybe give him give some purpose to his his I don't know anxious anxious cleaning. I'm I'm gonna dirty a glass or at least attempt to. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna approach and and just greet him. Uh, hello, hello, barkeep. Um, love to if it's not too much trouble. I'd love to uh, spend some of my coin here and, and indulge in the the. Uh, the local, the local ale. There's a moment where it seems like perhaps he hasn't heard you. But then, quite suddenly, he looks up from his glass and says, Would you like to order a drink? There's a, like a, a pregnant pause while, uh, Stash raises an eyebrow and then just trying to meet, meet his gaze, he says, um, yes, yeah, if it, if it's not too much trouble, my friend. No, no trouble at all. 
I've just, I just have to finish cleaning these glasses. You won't mind. Well, they, they, I mean, they, they're certainly clean enough for the likes of me. I, I, I say, trying, trying to get a, get a little laugh out of this man. And, <laughs> and I think um, the person in the corner who was sitting there sipping his wine, he yells out across the bar. He says, Arik, use the glasses behind you, Arik. And Arik says, ah, yes, no point in making a patron wait for me to finish the cleaning. And he turns and he grabs a clean glass from, the, from behind <laughs> him. And he pours you an ale. Uh, he says, that will be one silver piece, please. Uh, cer certainly, and I'll just place it right down on the bar. And he, he takes it, puts it in his little coffer, and then goes back to cleaning his glasses. I'll um, look over to the, the young man who, who came to my aid and just kind of raise, raise my glass at him and, and take a sip. And he raises his glass back. Uh, I'm going to cut away from there for a moment. Um, I need a quick bio break though. You guys can hang tight if you want. I just need like one minute. So I'll be right back. Hey, Matt. Yes. I see your picture has you cycling alongside what looks like an ocean. Yes. Are you on the East Coast or West Coast? Uh, I'm on the East Coast, um, but that, that might have been the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, cool. If I, if I had to guess, yeah. How about, how about you? Where are you from? I'm, I'm near Los Angeles, so, and I, I do oh, some okay. biking, so... I, I thought, well, maybe you're close by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that, that picture, it's been so long since I updated my, my Google profile, but that's from five years ago. I did a um, cross-country bike tour. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, but I started in San Diego. So at some point, I wasn't too far away cycling. San Diego to uh, the East Coast. That's Florida. incredible. Florida. I'd love to, love to hear about that someday. Sure. Uh, Polly, you got a question for me? Yeah, Polly maybe gets up his courage and goes into some of these uh, residences, uh, looks around, sits at the dining table, and he's wondering what happened to these people. Did, were they dragged from their houses? Did they leave of their own will? Did something come in and attack them? You notice... at one particular dining table you're sitting at. Abandoned, musty smell in the room. 
No food, sadly. Chairs knocked over, tin plates strewn about, cutlery, clay mugs smashed. But importantly, claw marks, deep gouges into the wood of the table. And you'll notice this in other places too, now that you're looking for it. Claw marks on doors, claw marks on exterior walls near windows, that kind of thing. Something routinely attacks the people of this village, drags them from their homes. Like a wolf claw, uh, that sort of thing, or something no, bigger? It's something deeper. bigger, yeah, something bigger, that's for sure. Yeah. Run, run my finger over one of the claws, and I just, I hiss. <laughs> <laughs> Instinctively, right? Leave the uh, leave the house. Nice. So, Goro, uh, unless you want to go further afield, uh, Bildrath's is, is nearby and not too far from where 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 um, where your companion ended up. Uh, the, the inn across the way. So, if Bildrath sounds good, we'll go there. Definitely. Uh, the sparse light from this building spills out from behind drawn heavy curtains. A sign over the door creaks on its hinges, proclaiming this Bildrath's mercantile. Pretty good sized building, about 70 feet long by 40 feet wide, actually. Um, if you go inside, uh, you will see a man who must be Bildrath behind the counter. Um, he's sitting on a high stool, it's a high counter. Um, he is, uh, he's quite, um, quite, I would say, plump is the right word to use. Um, on his shelves, he has some goods. You can tell he doesn't really keep a lot of the goods up near the front. Um, you do hear some commotion in the back or some, some movement in the back. He must have some kind of help here. Right? And... He looks up from you, looks up from his ledger, and says, uh, You're well fed. And your shop seems to be in rather good condition compared to the rest of this place. Uh, well, it's because I know how to keep my eye on people. I'm very, very good, you know, about keeping my eye on people, and I have assistance. And he calls out, <laughs> Periwimple, Periwimple, come up here, please. And you hear, yes, uncle. And a very large man, like a, a Gaston type man, steps out, right? He's got a leather, a leather tunic, but he's, he's bulging with muscle out of his leather tunic, right? Sweet face, you know, uh, young, but quite muscular. And he says, Periwimble helps me with the stock. He's also very, very good at chasing away the rats, if you know what I mean. Even great big fat rats, if you know what I mean. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm not looking for any trouble. I don't think you'll be needing Periwimple this hour anyway. Well, so what do you need? You got coin to spend? I can hear it jingling on your belt. Perhaps we will need some some coin. I think we we have some work to do in this town, me and my companions. But first, we must speak with the uh, the burgomaster. Do you know where uh, we can find him? It's been some time since we've seen the burgomaster. Oh, good. Oh gosh, how many days now, Periwinkle? And he says, uh, over a week, Uncle. At least over a week. Yes, no one's heard from or seen the Burgomaster in over a week. Nor has anyone seen his accursed daughter. Does he have a house? Has anyone gone looking for him? Well, 
and he kind of leans back. If you're just looking for directions, friend, I'm happy to point the way. If you want an insider's opinion on matters, uh, that'll cost you, I fear. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show him a couple of silver and ask, so what do you think is going on in this place? And he kind of like gives you a oily smile and says, if it weren't for the fog, you'd be able to see a little further ahead, up a great hill, Castle Ravenloft, home to Strad von Zarovich. He's lived there for over 400 years. Can you imagine that? A man living 400 years? One might expect that he is not, in fact, a man. One might expect, or suspect. In any case, this person who may or may not be a man, and who may or may not be 400 years old, has had a very, very intense fascination with the Burgomaster's daughter, or so I hear. Very intense fascination indeed. And I'll tell you something else, friend. He's reaching for the coin. You're not the first person to come through this way, not even in the last two, three weeks. And certainly, you're not the first person to come through this way. Now, let's just say our town has something of a history of people showing up, coming through this way, marching up the hill, sometimes even riding carriages up the hill, an attempt to slay Count Strahd. And they never come back. No, they never come back. So, would you like to buy some supplies? I may not have another chance to sell you. <laughs> I see. Before we get to that, one, one other question. You seem rather well informed in this place. Do you know of a, a woman that might have come here? She would be 45 or 50 years old now. Um, would have come through here about six years ago. Works as a a maid. Has a uh, what? What country are the rest of us from? Uh, I don't know. We'll just say country X. I don't know. <laughs> <We'll talk about laughs> later. <laughs> Similar accent to mine. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Ah, oh, I thought I placed your accent. Yes, yes, I may know something about that. Indeed. He holds his hand out. I'll place another coin into it. Well, you might be talking about Mad Mary. Don't know what the woman's name was that you're referring to, but I know a woman who talks like you and her name's Mad Mary. That's what we call her anyway. And where would I find her? Yeah. Just listen for the wailing, the crying in the streets. And if it quietens enough, you'll hear it again. Yeah, Sorry. of course. Um, what kind of equipment does he have? Uh, yeah, uh, if, if you want to do a little bit of shopping, you could get you can buy anything off the list. It's three times as expensive. Got it. You got to pay triple rate, but all right. But you have access to all of it. Um, meanwhile, back at the inn. So, Stash, you've you know you've made a little friendly rapport with this gentleman in the in the corner. Uh, what do you do? Um, well, seeing as. Uh... Was it uh, Arik, the the bar bartender? Right. Yeah. He's not. He's not very talkative. <laughs> yeah. Not so much of a convers conversationalist. I'll, not uh, so much. 
I'll, I'll make my over my way over to the young man in the corner. Nice. Um, he's kind of finely dressed. He has like a um, like a sort of you know like a fine silk tunic. Uh, good boots. Excuse me. Good boots. Um, uh, hail. Good looking, except for like he's got like a little scar on his cheek. Gives him character. Hmm. And he says. Hello, friend. My name's Ismark the Lesser. Ismark. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Stash. Um, the only. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I um, appreciate your help back there. I, I'm not sure how I would have... Uh, I didn't know the trick to, to pulling him out of his, his reverie. Uh, and uh, if not for you, I fear I, I'd be quite thirsty at this moment. You might be uh, Stash, the only. Mm -hmm. uh, what brings you to the village of Barovia? We were, well, it's uh, we received a, a message. Uh, my friend, my companion, and I—he's uh, about the town somewhere. Um, we received a message back home um, from from your burgomaster. In fact, um, do you, do you have this? This letter on you can, can can I see it? Um, I, th I think uh, yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, this guy, this guy seems friendly. Stash isn't even gonna hesitate. He's just gonna um, pull it, pull it out from his uh, coat coat pocket and just proffer it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is and this is the one that you originally. Got, not the one you found on the body. Right? Yes, yeah. correct. Yep. Good. Um, he reads it and he says, The Burgomaster did send out a letter of warning some time ago, has sent out several, I'm led to believe, but. This, this letter was not written by his hand, friend. This is not his handwriting. Oh, interesting. And, and you are well acquainted with the man to, to, know his, to know his handwriting? I am indeed, because I was the Burgomaster's adopted son. In the, in the past tense, how did he? That's interesting. Yes, I fear he's not with us anymore. Oh, uh, I'm well. Terribly, terribly sorry for your loss. Um, is there what of what of his uh, successor? Do you mean his daughter, Irina? Well, I mean, uh, I assume someone, someone. Oh, the new burgomaster. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, yes. no, no, no. Trust me, no one wants that job. Uh, what would they even be burgomaster of? Mad Mary? Fat Bildrath? <laughs> Simple Arik? Yeah, a handful of people? Sh it did seem behind their doors? Yeah. It did seem a bit grim upon walking into town. What? Uh, what is it that, think that plagues... Drink, friend? But I've never, never lacked for a good reason. Um, Fair enough. He pours another glass. What, what is it that that plagues this town? He drinks it down and says, <clears throat> "Well, since you're here, maybe you should, maybe you should talk to my sister, your adopted sister, the, the adopted burgomaster's sister. daughter, my adopted sister, Irina." Yes. I'm sure she can tell you more. Well, I, I would appreciate that. I mean, where where is she? He'll give you directions to the the burgomaster's mansion. Okay. And he says, "I'd come with you, but uh, well, he like holds the bottle up. He says, they say it starts to spoil as soon as you expose it to air.'" And he 
pours another glass. Well, I, I've heard the same, but I've, I've never even put it to the test. Um, good man, good man. I'm going to cut over to Polly. So Polly, maybe you're somewhere in the vicinity of where your friends are, your new friends. Maybe not. Where do you head? Um, well, as soon as I put two and two together about these claws, I, I head back out into the street. These houses are clearly not safe, and I'm looking for my friends because I need to get someplace safe. And... Uh, I don't really know where they are, so maybe I peek in some windows of shops and, and start to get a little bit more frantic, and finally I end up either at the uh, mercantile or the uh, tavern. I'm not sure which one. Um, we'll, say, we'll say the mercantile. Okay. You end up there, and maybe you see, you'll, you'll see Goro, like, you know, looking over some wares. Periwimple is bringing out various things to show you from the back, right? To keep all the good stuff in the back, right? And, um, and you know, maybe you're arguing over prices. I don't know, whatever you're doing, Goro. Um, and Bildrath looks past you, Goro, when this little fellow walks in and says, Hello, friend. Are you sure this is where you need to be? I sort of stumble in and look around. Wait, wait, oh, Goro. And I, I don't pay any attention to Bildreth. I run straight up to Goro and, and grab his his uh, robe again. And I'm just, I'm kind of like um, clenching it in my fists and, and wringing your robe. Goro, it's, it's not safe here. I do believe you're right about that. It seems the man we came to see has gone missing. Why, what have Claw you found? Mark. Claw marks, claws. Claws are everywhere. Friend, I'm like, oh. I couldn't help but overhear the jingling in your purse. Have you come to buy something? Have you come to shop? I look around, uh, maybe at the uh, things on the shop, but Maybe also I'm looking for claw marks in the walls. I don't see any and start to calm down and settle down. And... Hmm. Store all this stuff. What? What are you? What are you buying, Gordo? Just look at what's in front of you. It's like uh, some leather armor and some some holy water. Holy water. I snatch up a, a vial of holy water and uh, maybe I recognize it maybe just from the symbols. I know it's supposed to be good at any rate. I, I put that in front of uh, Bildrath's face. How, how much? Hold on, I have to look. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's 30 somewhere at the, at the triple rate. At the triple yeah. price. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, was, yeah. He's like, oh, yes, 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 yes. Holy water. Blessed by an archbishop, as it turns out. It's going to be 30 silver for that holy water, friend. But I assure you, if you plan on trekking up the mountain, you're going to need it. Yes, indeed. I'm holding the, the vial in my fist and, and look in at him, barely probably able to go over the, uh, the counter. What mountain? Good question. You actually can't see it. <laughs> That's a great cut. That's where we'd cut in the movie, right? Um, well, so Stash, where do you head after you get this information from this uh, Ismark character? Um, well, I mean, I think after yeah, hearing this, this grim news, I think I'm just back outside and not really interested in drinking so much anymore. Um, but more interested in, in finding my, my companions. Um, yeah, you, you can meet up with them for sure. Um, and if okay. you guys want to do any shopping, you can, you can do that. We don't have to have the scene, but um, uh, if, you, if you don't mind paying triple price <laughs> for everything. 
Um, I don't know that we're going to be running into another shop out here. So. That's a good point. Yeah, there's probably, it's probably not going to be. It's, uh, there's probably not going to be a shop in the dungeon. It's not that old school. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, inexplicable shops in dungeons are my favorite aspects of old, old modules. Right? It's like, what's this shop doing here? <laughs> who's, who's buying the stuff? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, if you guys want to take a minute to shop, you can do that real fast. We'll just kind of take it out of the fiction for a minute if you want to cover that stuff. Um, otherwise, and you could be you could be shopping in, you know, as we go. Um, but otherwise, um, once you're all back together, where do you head? What do you do? Well, I mean, I'm going to you know relay the information um, that you know the burgomaster is you know no longer among us, but also you know, say that, you know, I, I know where his house is and uh, that's where Irina is. That bastard mercantile build wrath paid him two silver and he didn't even bloody tell me the guy was dead. Oh. <laughs> wow. He's, he's a shrewd one. <laughs> he's a shrewd one. <laughs> <laughs> that's one word for him. Anyway. What now? Talk to the daughter? Um, I, I guess so. Or, or maybe, maybe we find, find some place. I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I was about to say that perhaps we should find a place to, to spend the evening, but I'm, I'm not even comfortable at that inn. There was it's something wrong. It's barely with the 5 PM. It's barely 5 PM. You guys have got plenty of time before you have to crash. Just FYI. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, no time, no time like the present. Well, let's go. Uh, let's go find the daughter. Perhaps she knows what happened to her father. She's not in the castle, is she? No, 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 no. The uh, burgomaster's house, right here in town. Oh, good. As you're leaving, Bill Drath says, "It was nice meeting you. I suspect we're not going to get a chance." to get further acquainted. As he's counting his coin from whatever you bought. Let's talk about the house and then this will be our last little thing. As you step out into the street, I will remind you, you do hear the sobbing and wailing still of Mad Mary. Uh, Goro, just FYI. Yeah. The Burgomaster's home. A weary looking mansion squats behind a rusting iron fence. The iron gates are twisted and torn. The right gate lies cast aside while the left swings crazily in the wind. The stuttering squeal and clang of the gate repeats with mindless precision. Weeds choke the grounds and press with menace upon the house itself. Yet against the walls, the growth has been trodden under to form a path all about the domain. Heavy claw markings have stripped the once beautiful finish off the walls. Great black blottings tell of the fires that have assailed the walls. Not a pane nor shard of glass stands in any window. All the windows are barred with heavy planking, each plank marked with stains of evil omen. And that's where we will end the session. So um, we, we'll, do, we'll do debrief after session two. Uh, this is just kind of a get everything going session. So um, I will just say uh, that I had a lovely time. I thought you guys did great. Uh, we, are, we are right where we need to be to start session two. We got right where I thought we would. So I'm really happy about that. <laughs> uh, so I, I love it when like timings work just like I think they're going to. Like I think we'll get right here. Boom. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Awesome. Do you guys have any questions or anything? No, no questions. I just final want to XP say... award too as well. I have to give you that. Uh, let's do XP uh, real fast before we keep going. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Do some calculating real fast. That would be okay. So if, uh, adventure XP. That's treasure and and everything else. So you guys are going to each get. 
320 more. And then did anybody hit a flag? Yeah, we didn't really get a chance to dig into it because the wolves appeared immediately. But I was <laughs> attempting to to tell Pally that, you know, when we're out in the woods and the fog is is rolling in, the uh, the monsters can't see us just like we can't see them. I don't know. Did you believe me? I kind of, I kind of, I thought it was a good moment because <laughs> then it was like immediately disproved. <laughs> did, did you believe him even momentarily, Polly? <laughs> yeah, for a second. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, that sounds good. Um, yeah, you can take 100 XP for that if you want. All right. um, and then I think uh, someone did stashes, right? Um, yeah, I, yes. I told them I was lucky. Right, that's right. Yeah, you can take 100 XP for that. Stosh, did you do one? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe initially where I touched the, the vampire on the shoulder um, might have been hitting Goro's flag. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking when I pulled out the holy symbol. But, but I, yeah, I could go either way on that. Which um, was the one that you... Uh... Oh, get into a dangerous situation there. Oh, I thought that was, yeah, because yeah, you kind of stepped up into it. I thought that was good, actually. I thought that was a really great moment. Yeah, you, you can take, uh, if, if Goro agrees, I say take 100 XP for that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, cool. Uh, all right, so you should have all ended at, what, 620, I guess? Cool. Okay, sorry. So I interrupted you. What were we about to say earlier, <laughs> Matt? <laughs> oh, oh, no worries. Um, no, just that this is my has been my first uh, gauntlet experience. And, oh, cool. Yeah, cool. I just want to thank all of you. Yeah. I hope it Delight, was delightful. I hope it was delightful. Good, yeah. Awesome. Cool, cool. Well, awesome. Well, we'll be happy to see you uh, in future sessions. Um, I'm going to let you guys go, but it was great fun. Um, and Jason, I just wanted to give okay. you a heads up that I will probably have to miss the last.